Tonight's top EU stories from the unit website include 60 mile per hour green speed limit on UK motorways. UK farm ministers call for EU to approve genetically modified corn in a vote. And European Union must lead way on food production. Nicola Sturgeon says Scottish independence is less risky than remaining part of the United Kingdom. Plus, David Cameron prepares nuclear option on EU referendum. I'm Rick Timmis and this is the Unit Nightly News. First, from our homepage, the speed limit on one of Britain's busiest motorways is to be cut from 70 miles an hour to 60 miles per hour under a controversial plan to meet European Union pollution targets. The first environmental speed limit is set to be imposed within months on a 32-mile stretch of the M1 for seven days a week from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. The limit will be in place for several years and any driver caught breaking it faces a hefty fine and penalty points on their licence. Whitehall sources said last night that a handful of other smart motorway schemes currently in the pipeline could have green maximum speed limits imposed to meet air quality targets and avoid Brussels fines. A section of the M3 from Junction 2 to Junction 4A near London is currently undergoing environmental assessment to see if measures will need to be put in place to cut pollution levels there. Well, well, so far we've had vehicle emission controls which have been tightened year on year and caused a big increase in early scrappages. Heck, they even came up with a special scheme for squashing your motor. We've had manufacturer legislation and now speed restrictions. Do we think it will reduce air pollution? Not on your Nelly. Open borders equals more people. More people equals more cars and more road transport, which in turn means more air pollution. But here's an idea. How about taking £500 million a year for the next five years and investing it in extending the rail networks by reinstating some of the old branch lines with a view to moving much of the road haulage onto trains? Now that would significantly reduce air pollution. The trouble is, where do we find £500 million? Well, we've got an idea. How about we take a one-day-per-month holiday from our £50 million a day European Union membership subscription for 10 months of the year? That ought to cover it. Britain's farm minister called on the European Union to approve a strain of genetically modified maize in a vote later this month, saying such a move was supported by scientific evidence. Now, if approval is granted, then it will be the first genetically modified food crop authorised for planting by the EU for 15 years. Owen Paterson told the Oxford Farming Conference on Tuesday. Europe risks becoming the museum of world farming as innovative companies make decisions to invest and develop new technologies in other markets, he said. The proposal covers an insect-resistant maize developed jointly by DuPont and Dow Chemical. If approved, it would be the second GM crop that will be grown in the European Union after Monsanto won approval for another insect-resistant corn variety in 1998. By comparison, GM crops are grown widely in America and parts of Asia. Now look, this is serious stuff, and to date the EU has been very cautious about GM crops, and that is a good thing. Back in the 1950s, DDT was labelled as safe. It took many years for the first signs of ecological collapse to appear, but it resulted in the extinction of native peregrine falcons in the UK and almost wiped out the red kite. The peregrines were artificially reintroduced after a nationwide campaign of diligent hard work by falconers, but even today, 50 years after being banned, the red kite populations are still nowhere near their original population levels in the UK. The active ingredients in these products act upon the internal digestive systems of insects, essentially dissolving their gut, and they are not species-specific. We better hope that the EU gets this right, because, as Einstein said, 
If the bee disappears from the surface of the earth, man would have no more than four years to live. This was the message from Simon Coveney, Irish Minister for Agriculture, Food and the Marine at Oxford Farming Conference at Oxford University on January the 6th. Delegates heard, with the end of sugar and milk quotas on the horizon, the EU needed to be well placed for possibilities in the industry. We are recognising the EU needs to lead the way on food production in the future, he said. Mr Coveney claimed future policy needed to move away from controls and intervention on overpricing, and he said, We are trying to get a conversation going between farming families with a new generation of farmers who understand the needs of the environment and food production, possibly better than their parents did. OK, let's rewind for a moment and put that another way. So, he's saying they are trying to get the young farmers within farming families to listen to the EU's ideas of how to run a farm instead of the traditional tried and tested model that has proven to work over centuries. Hmm, <laughs> and just how successful has EU farming policy been? Well, this video got posted out by the European Commission yesterday on Google+, Plus as part of the European Union's common fisheries policy. Now, as you can see, it's a comparison between appropriate fish stock sizes, and the message is, your girlfriend <laughs> likes them big. So if you rock up holding a little sprat, she's going to be very disappointed. Now, I felt compelled to comment as follows. Well, what a demonstration of stupidity. The common fisheries policy, quota and bureaucratic legislation is what has brought EU fish stocks to its knees. This video is a joke. Firstly, the undersized fish do not make it to shore. They're tossed dead into the sea to feed the seagulls so that the fishermen don't get fined for overquota or incorrect fish type. So in a nutshell, if we hand over farming to the EU, it's like having a blind man yell at a deaf dog. Nicola Sturgeon has warned Scotland, remaining part of the United Kingdom, is a riskier option than independence as she attempted to persuade Labour voters to gamble with a yes vote in September's referendum. The Deputy First Minister used the Nationalists' first major intervention of 2014 to try and turn the tables on the Unionists, who have repeatedly highlighted uncertainty over issues such as a separate Scotland's currency. Now here's an interesting thought for you. When David Cameron was petitioned to hold a referendum over the UK's membership of the EU, he did his utmost to whip that out of the House. When asked about a referendum for an independent Scotland, he couldn't do enough to help. Now let's be clear, the political rhetoric has made it absolutely clear that Scotland is not going to be independent. It simply wants to move from being overseen by the Parliament in Westminster to the Parliament in Brussels. The European Union has a regional vision for the UK and two of those regions are Scotland and Wales, wholesale. Does it not strike you as odd that both these regions have their own parliaments? A truly independent Scotland would look much more like Iceland, in our opinion, which would involve a wholesale repatriation of governance back to the people of Scotland, which, well, frankly, under a democratic system, is what should have been in the first instance. David Cameron is prepared to use special constitutional powers to ensure the plans for an EU referendum become law before the next election. The Prime Minister has pledged to use the Parliament Act to overpower the House of Lords and get the EU referendum bill onto the statute books before 2015, it is understood. Mr Cameron fears the bill, which promises to give the British public a vote on membership of the European Union by 2017, could be killed in the House of Lords by Labour and Liberal Democrat peers, and that would leave the Conservatives vulnerable to attacks by UKIP in the next election. Aha! And there we have it, the true motivation in those final lines. David Cameron is not interested in the people's democratic rights. He's becoming fearful that Nigel Farage's underdog party UKIP might just give him a run for his money at the next general election. Well, let's think where we'll be in 2015. The Office of National Statistics predicts the UK debt to have skyrocketed to £700 billion, to which the government's only solution is to print more money. And Mark Carney is down on record as telling the bond markets he will take the Bank of England's balance sheet from £4 trillion to £9 trillion. Now, as you can see from our website, you've got EU rules and regulations pouring over the dike all over the place, 
and it's obvious legislation that everyone can see. 60 mile an hour speed limits on the M1, floods of immigration. I could go on, <laughs> and I often do. However, couple this with the help to buy scheme, otherwise known as Georgie Porgy's Let's Reinflate the Housing Bubble, which will increase personal debt for the people. Now, when the interests start to rise, and they will, the economy is going to fall flat on its ass. Does David Cameron really think, in the face of all this evidence, that his attempt to appease the people will wash? <laughs> well, according to this article, apparently he does. Now, speaking of EU legislation pouring over the dike, let's see what our research team have dug up from the catacombs of the kleptocrats' mansions in Brussels. Recovery and Resolution Framework for Non-Banking Institutions It is stipulated that there should be a ladder of intervention for non-bank financial institutions. Competent authorities should have the wherewithal to monitor the financial health of these institutions and have the power to intervene early in cases of financial stress. The report states the importance of CPPs having comprehensive recovery arrangements to facilitate protection, amounting to a sum above that which is required by the European Market Infrastructure Regulation. Well, ultimately this is another cog in the machinery of European fiscal, i.e. monetary, governance, which means developing a centralised European treasury, which you sort of need if you're looking to be a federal superstate. Now... <laughs> Negotiations for an EU-Canada Strategic Partnership Agreement. Now, the report recalls that negotiations with Canada date back as far as 1976. The SPA that is currently under negotiation aims to rejuvenate the relationship between the EU and Canada, and it should also provide the citizens of Europe and Canada with tangible benefits and opportunities in light of broadening the transatlantic market. Now, there is much going on globally in regard to these trade agreements. The US is forging ahead with the EU via its transatlantic partnership and developing similar across the Pacific with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, of which Congress hasn't even been allowed to see what's in it, although it has been asked to vote on it. Sounds like the EU set up. <laughs> Let's not forget what Monet said at the United Nations in 1952. The nations of Europe should be guided towards a supranational state without their people understanding what is happening. This can be achieved by successive steps, each disguised as having an economic purpose, but which will eventually, and irreversibly, lead to a federation. Now a search on our website for EU Canada will bring back this story and more information on the topic as it has developed. I have also included a link to Brave New Europe Part 2, which is in our articles section, and which gives you more clarity on what the agenda in Europe has been all along. Now, interestingly, there is plenty of fishy business going on in the dark halls of Strasbourg. What with outlying member states being taken on in the Indian Ocean, and it never fails to make me smile that there are parts of Europe in the Indian Ocean. Of course, there is plenty of news about the west coast of Africa, as the EU looks to secure fishing rights there too. So no surprise that this piece of legislation is bounding through the Parliament. Deep sea species are generally considered to be those that live at greater depths than 400 metres. These characteristics make them particularly vulnerable to fishing pressure and mean that for many stocks, recovery from depletion is likely to take a very long time or not happen at all. Of course, you've got the usual keen and critical thinking that can only be achieved by drinking Belgian coffee with a puffed up kleptocrat. But here goes. The section... Obligation to record and report all catches of deep sea species. The report introduced an obligation to report all catches of deep sea species in terms of species composition, weight and sizes, whether subject to a special fishing authorization or not. So, my fishing friends, remember, write down everything you catch and bring it home so you can be taxed, fined or penalised accordingly. We don't expect any of that chuck it over the side and say it's got nought to do with me going on. I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for the unit, Nightly News. I'll see you soon. <laughs>